A pleasant evening to y'all. We're grateful that you've tuned in tonight and that we can study the Word of God together. We're thankful that we have this medium that we can study together, but I'll tell you, it's not the same. We sure miss seeing everyone face to face, and we long for the day that we're back together, and we hope that that day comes soon. We're mindful of those who've been sick, and we continue to think about you and pray for you. Uh, we are mindful of the elders and the decisions that they have to make, and we ask that you pray for them. Ask that you continue to pray for Brother Guy. We're so thankful for him and his work and his dedication to the truth. He's just such an encouraging gentleman, and we're so thankful for him and Sister Anne. If you take your Bible and turn with me to the book of John and the fourth chapter, we'll begin our study there, John chapter 4. And look, if you will, at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I stand amazed every time I open my Bible and study the Word of God, the different places you find Jesus. But one thing I was thinking about in the book of John in the fourth chapter is you find Jesus going through Samaria. In fact, the business you find Jesus saying he must go through Samaria. Now, the Jews and the Samaritans did not have much to do with one another, as the Samaritan woman pointed out. And you would find that many times when those people from who were in Jerusalem or Judea would go to Galilee, instead of going through the country of Samaria, would go a longer way around so they would not have to go through that particular part and region. But notice at this time, Jesus said he must go through Samaria. And when you take your Bible, notice that when Jesus was in there, that city near Sicker, that Jesus sat by the well. And notice that that is identified as Jacob's well. And notice the people of Samaria would come there and draw water. And so there is Jesus at Sicker, and Jesus is sitting by the well. But if you take your Bible, I want you to think about it. In the book of John and the fourth chapter, that because Jesus stayed when the disciples went to get food, a great occurrence happened. I want you to think about because Jesus stayed by the well, he met the woman who came. And notice the fact that she is coming at the sixth hour, which would be noon. Now, most of the time, the women would go together to get draw water early in the morning before the heat of the day. And it appears this woman may have been an outcast, because she's by herself coming to get water at the noonday heat. And observe with me that when she arrives, Jesus is there. And notice in your Bible that Jesus says to her, Give me some water. And notice at that time, she begins to have a discussion with Jesus, and Jesus begins to tell her about living water. He's not talking about water that one might drink from the well of Jacob. He is saying he's the living water that he can give eternal life. Then in your Bible, in the book of John, in the fourth chapter, you'll find that Jesus said, go bring your husband here. And you'll remember she said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you rightly said, you've had five, and the one you're with now you're just living with. And that woman said, you are a prophet. But then you'll recall that that woman goes back to the village of Samaria, and she tells the people of that place that Jesus is there and that he is the Christ. Look in your Bible, in the book of John, and the fourth chapter again, and notice what Jesus says. In John chapter 4, and verse 35, 
when the disciples had came back and they had offered him food, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Some say that could have been the Samaritans heading out wearing their white robes to meet Jesus. But if you will, drop down to verse 39. Notice in verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Of course, stay. And notice that Jesus stayed there, and notice in verse 41, many more believed because of his own work. Therefore they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Have you ever thought about what occurred because Jesus stayed? When Jesus stayed by the well, He met one Samaritan woman. And this woman, He talked about and explained to her about living water. She goes back to the uh, village and tells others and testifies about Jesus. And notice, they come out and Jesus teaches them. And notice, He stays two more days to teach the people. Have you ever thought about what happened in Samaria because Jesus stayed? But even if you take your Bible for just a moment, turn with me to the book of John and the 10th chapter. And when you come to the book of John and the 10th chapter, Jesus had been teaching the people at that time, and the Jews are rejecting the teaching of Jesus. And in particular, the religious leaders. And you'll find, beginning in verse 31, they took up stones and they were going to stone Jesus because he said that he was before Abraham. He said that he and his father are one in verse 30. And they were going to kill him because they said, you make yourself equal with God. And my friend, he is equal with God. He's God the Son. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But then if you take your Bible, you'll observe that Jesus escaped out of their hand. And the Bible says in verse 40, He went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there He stayed. Underscore, He stayed. Now, Jesus is out in this place that is a little more isolated. Jesus isn't in the great big city. Jesus is out past the Jordan where John was, and we know that was wilderness. But notice, many came to Him. Notice that with John, many would go out into the wilderness, and notice, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in Him there. Have you ever thought that when Jesus was out in the wilderness, that many people came to believe in Him because of the signs and miracles He performed, but also because of His teaching? And because he stayed there, there were many who came to believe that he is the Christ. Thus far, I've seen two things. I've seen Jesus staying by the well and talking to one woman. And that one woman going back to her village, bringing out people, and many became disciples because of her. Then I see Jesus going out into the wilderness and staying there. And people came out to hear him proclaim the truth. Because Jesus stayed, there were great events that occurred. But then if you take your Bible, turn over again and look in the book of John in the 11th chapter. And when you come to the book of John in the 11th chapter, you'll find a third occurrence. This time you'll find in verses 4 through 6 that Jesus had a friend identified as Lazarus. And he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And the Bible says in verse 4, or verse 3, that the sisters sent for Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But notice Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now look at verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There's no doubt, there's no controversy. Jesus loved that family. But look again in your Bible and look verse 6 and notice carefully. 
So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed, underscored stayed, two more days in the place where he was. Now where was he? Well, we read at the end of chapter 10, he was out past the Jordan. But now he says, let us go back to Judea in verse 7. And the disciples say, Rabbi, when you were there last time, they wanted to stone you. And you want to go there again? And Jesus said, we're going to go. And I want you to think about, my friends, they go back. But because Jesus stayed two more days, you'll remember Lazarus died. And in your Bible, in the book of John, in the 11th chapter, verse 21, Martha came to Jesus and she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Then if you take your Bible, you'll find Mary says the same thing in verse 32. She fell down at the feet of Jesus, saying to Him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But have you ever thought because Jesus stayed and didn't come when they first summoned Him, that they saw a great miracle? That Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept, but then Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, said, move away the stone. And you'll remember Lazarus came forth bound in grave clothes, and he said, loose him and let him go. Had Jesus came when they first summoned him, they would not have seen the great miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But then I want you to think about something else. Take your Bible, if you will, kindly, and look in the book of Matthew in the 14th chapter. Or you could look in the parallel account of Mark 6. But in Matthew chapter 14, notice with me a statement that is made when Jesus sent the disciples away. Look in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now when evening came, He was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for just one moment. Here are the disciples in the middle of the sea, and there's a great storm. On the Sea of Galilee, a storm can arise with a snap of a finger. They have a hard time even today predicting when a storm will come up. And a storm can come up over those mountains that are surround that sea, that body of water. And I'll tell you, that wind can just cause a ship to be driven to and fro. And notice the disciples at this time are out in the middle of the sea. But where's Jesus? He had stayed behind so He could pray. Oh, I would I could hear that prayer. Could you imagine being with Jesus when He poured His heart out to His Father? And He'd gone up on the mountain by Himself to pray, and He was alone there. But then, in the book of Matthew, in the 14th chapter, notice that when the storm came in the fourth watch of the night, it said Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, had Jesus gotten in the boat with them, they would have never saw that miracle. Had Jesus gotten in the boat and crossed over with them instead of staying and praying, they would not have seen that great event, Jesus walking on the water, and Peter would have never walked on water. But because Jesus stayed, because He stayed behind and prayed, when the storm came and they saw Him walking on water, Jesus could say, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. But I want you to think of one other incident with me. Open your Bible to the book of Matthew in the 27th chapter. And when you come to the book of Matthew in the 27th chapter, you remember they've nailed Jesus to the cross of Calvary. And it says in verse 39, And those who pass by blasphemed Him, wagging their heads, and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest, also mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself He cannot save. If He is the King of Israel, let Him now come down from the cross, and we will believe Him. He trusted in God. Let Him deliver Him now if He'll have Him. For He said, I am the Son of God. Have you ever thought, my friend, here were the people blaspheming, ridiculing, mocking, belittling the Son of God? 
And you know, my friend, they're saying, come down and we'll believe you. They wouldn't have. He'd raised Lazarus from the dead and they still didn't believe. But I want you to think about something very important. Have you ever thought about because Jesus stayed on the cross, what that means for you and me? He had the power to come down. Jesus had said earlier in the book of Matthew, in the 26th chapter, I could call 12 legions of angels. But Jesus didn't call the angels. Jesus stayed on the cross. Though He had the power to come down, though He could have come down at any time, Jesus stayed so He could take away our sin. He died as a sacrifice for the sin of you and me. Oh, I would I could get into the heart of people the importance of Jesus staying on the cross. That He stayed there because had He not stayed there, we would be destined to an eternal hell. I want to take that. I want to make several points in the lesson here. The first thing I want us to think about is we need to stay faithful. When I look at places Jesus stayed, I see the providence of God. I see the work of God. And then I think about in our lives, Jesus has been so good to us and blessed us. And if we have put on Christ in baptism, I'll tell you what we need to do is remain faithful. Stay dedicated to Him. Open your Bible to the Hebrew letter and the 10th chapter. And when you come to the Hebrew letter and the 10th chapter, notice what G, or what the Hebrew writer said in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. In other words, let us stay. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. He said, be faithful. Stay in Christ. Paul talks about being faithful to the end so that you can receive the crown of life. We need to be dedicated in this time where we're not able to assemble like we would love. And we're kind of separated. We need to remember one thing. We need to stay dedicated to God. We need to be studying. We need to be praying. We need to be doing those things that draw us nearer to God. He said, let us draw near with a true heart. I'll tell you, we need to stay faithful. And I'll tell you something that frightens me, and I'll be honest with you, it scares me to death. I wonder how many people will, when this quarantine is lifted, come back to the assembly. How many people are going to use this as an excuse to get away from assembly to worship God? And I'll tell you something, my beloved friend. We need to look forward to the day that we can worship together and not enjoy being separated. That brings up something else. And this is very important. Open your Bible to first or Second Timothy chapter 3. And notice we need to stay in sound doctrine. We need to continue to follow the Word of God. We need to do that which God has revealed to us. In Second Timothy chapter 3, look at what Paul told Timothy in verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He says you continue in the Scripture. You continue in sound doctrine. He basically says the same thing to Titus in Titus 2. We need to abound in sound doctrine. We need to stay with the Word of God. We don't need any man-made creed. We don't need any catechism. We need God's Word. But then I want you to think of something else. Now's the time to come. If you've never put your life right with God, now is the time to make your life right. I tell you, you can call me day or night, anytime. And I'll tell you what, I'd be glad to baptize you into Christ. Because I'll tell you, in Matthew 16, 25, the question is asked, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I'll tell you, there's nothing on this earth worth exchanging your soul for because everything here will one day be destroyed, but your soul will live on somewhere for eternity. Then there's a time to go. 
In Mark 16, 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is a commission to every one of us. But I want to close with this thought. Have you ever looked at the cross and thought about how much Jesus loved you? And because He stayed there, we can have pardon. Our sins can be pardoned. But a pardon is only good if it's accepted. When Andrew Jackson was president, there was a man named George Wilson who robbed a train that was carrying mail. And he murdered a man. And at that time, some influential friends went to Andrew Jackson and he was scared, the, uh, George Wilson was to be hung and, and Andrew Jackson said he would pardon him for that, but he would still have to spend some time in prison for the other crimes. But when it got back to George Wilson, he refused the pardon. And they didn't know what to do with that. No one had ever refused a presidential pardon before. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court Justice at that time, the Chief Justice, was John Marshall, and he wrote this. A pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power of entrusted with execution of laws, but delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom tendered, and we have no power in a court to force it upon him. That's the true with Jesus. Jesus offers us a pardon, but He doesn't force us to take it. And because George Wilson refused a pardon, Marshall said he must hang, and hang he did. And I'll tell you something. There's going to be a lot of people lost in eternity because they refused the pardon of Jesus. They refused to obey His will. Anytime I look at the cross and I see Jesus staying there, when He could have come down at a moment's notice. I see how much He hates sin. And I see how much He loves the sinner. And I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to live to please Him because one day I want to stay with Him in heaven forever. Let's pray. Almighty God, we lift our eyes up to Thee by faith, grateful for every blessing we receive at Your hand. We're so thankful, Father, that Your Son was willing to stay on the cross of Calvary so that our sins could be blotted out. We're so thankful, Father, for that great demonstration of love. We're so thankful, Father, that He was willing to give His life for us. And Father, we're so thankful that through His blood, that when we're immersed into Him through baptism, we can have our sins washed away. Our Father, we pray for those who are outside the ark of safety, May we say or do something that would touch their heart where they would obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for our church family at O'Neill. And we pray, Father, that soon we'll be back together and that we'll stir one another up to good works and that we'll have the kind of love we need to have for one another, that we help one another in this life navigate our way to heaven. We pray, Father, for those who are sick, those who are grieving, those who at this time are struggling, Father, we pray you put your hand on them and help them and comfort them and strengthen them and give them peace of mind. Help us in every endeavor to glorify you. And Father, may when this life be over, may we be able to stay with you forever in paradise. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.